could understand the structure of how we operated. So, yeah, do you mind? So, earlier this morning, we described that we had a really willing group of participants who have been paired on each panel. So, on each panel, you'll see two people, or two pairs that have spoken to each other already before they started this process, before they started presenting. So, uh, they've been asked to talk about questions of how, they, what their work is to first present it to each other, to talk about how they collaborate, to look for maybe holes where they, or gaps where they could collaborate better. Um, they were asked to talk about their life work balance and maybe how that relates to some of the research. And then finally, whether or not gender is impacting any of those pieces. So the conversations over the day have actually um, been a lot about the work and have gone in a really great direction. So we're hoping to just continue that conversation. Thanks, guys. Talk a show. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Cool. Um, it has been an awesome day, and this is going to be the awesomest. <laughs> um, no, as good. Uh, the panel is entitled Sociopolitical, and we have four presenters. Instead of me coming up every time the presenters change, I want to present all of them right now so that there's no disruption. And the two. So as Anna explained, there has been two pairs of two people. Um, Michelle Provost spoke with uh, Laura Heyman, and Dr. Shaba Bhatia spoke with Lori Brown. Uh, but I'm going to present in the order of presentations. Um, Dr. Michelle Provost is an architectural historian, curator, and consultant on urban planning and architectural affairs. Um, she is a member of Crimson Architectural Historians in Rotterdam, uh, also WIMBY, which is Welcome in My Backyard group in Rotterdam. Uh, she's also the uh, author of Hugh Maskant, Architect of Progress, and uh, most recently she has been the director of International Newtown Institute in Almere. Dr. Uh, Shoba Bhatia, is a Meredith professor and professor in civil and environmental engineering here at Syracuse University. Um, her current research efforts focus on the testing, development, design, and innovative use of sustainable natural and polymer polymeric materials for the protection of water quality. Um, she's developing a new and innovative products made of natural fibers to minimize soil erosion. She's also the director of the Women in Science and Engineering Initiative at Syracuse University. Laura Heyman is an associate professor of photography in the Department of Transmedia here at Syracuse University. She has shown at so many galleries and uh, has received so many grants. I'm going to just pick a few. Uh, to share with you. She has shown a palette gallery in New York, Deutsches Poland Institute in Deutschland, um, United Nations in New York, and National Portrait Gallery in London. She's also uh, a recipient of fellowships from Lightwork, the Silver Eye Center for Photography, and Ragdale and NIFA. Lastly, but not, uh, uh, yeah, lastly, Do well, Lori Brown. Has, <laughs> sorry, is the uh, crown jewel of um, architecture school here. She is the author of Feminist Practices, Interdisciplinary Approaches to Women in Architecture and Contested Spaces, Abortion Clinics, Women's Shelters, and Hospitals. Um, she's also the co founder and co leader of Architects, a women and architecture group in New York City. She is an associate professor of architecture at Syracuse University and is a registered architect in the state of New York. Uh, so first, please welcome Michelle Provost. Thanks for the introduction, Italia. Um, I would like to use my uh, 10 minutes of time and 11 slides, sorry, one 
one too many, to uh, walk you through uh, the work of uh, my office, uh, Crimson, Architectural Historians. Uh, an office, uh, as you talk, explained, I'm from the Netherlands and uh, we're based in, uh, in Rotterdam. And as you see, uh, the, the men are a minority in our office. Um, for the last 20 years, um, we have a jubilee this year. Uh, we've been practicing this office and um, it's from a point of view of this uh, uh, conference, it's interesting to note that architectural historians is still in the name of our office, though it is, it is really at the core of the work that we do, but it has also uh, shifted a little bit to the background because it has become, by its nature, uh, of being involved with uh, the city and urban planning become uh, really interdisciplinary. So I will try to focus on these aspects, the interdisciplinary and the uh, sociopolitical. So the work of our office um, is, for, on the one hand, it is belonging to this, uh, the body of work of architectural history, um, as you would expect it to be. So it's research and writing, and uh, we published uh, a number of books which, are, which have to do like MASCOM, which is my uh, dissertation. So it's kind of a, a classical work on a, a biography of an, uh, of an architect. Uh, or it's on topics of the history of Rotterdam. So that's all the classical architectural uh, history work that you would uh, expect. On the other hand, from the beginning on, 20 years ago, we've also done uh, other kinds of work, which is to be part of um, design teams uh, in urban planning in the different parts of, uh, of Holland in uh, large-scale um, urban planning projects. This might be a laser pointer. Yeah like this one, which is uh, 30,000 houses for Utrecht, which is a middle-sized town in the Netherlands. And we were part of the design team, uh, because as we were talking in, uh, during lunch break with the uh, students, urban planning means something different in, uh, in the Netherlands or in Europe than uh, it might mean here. Uh, as I understand, in the US there's a difference between urban planning, urban design, and then maybe some other variations on what I would call um, making city, that is the literal translation of Stedenbau, or making city in, in the Netherlands. And uh, of course, if you talk about how to make a city, uh, it becomes quite clear that this is by nature interdisciplinary. It's not only a matter of design. And uh, in the teamwork that uh, is involved with this, uh, this kind of urban planning, the historian plays, uh, can play uh, an uh, an important role as the one who conceptualize future changes and transformations. And this is the way that we work with uh, a number of uh, urban planners in the Netherlands, but that we also uh, came up with a number of uh, urban planning concepts ourselves for transformation of um, uh, parts of uh, Dutch cities. And as you see, it takes a different shape than uh, a normal urban plan because it's partly based on text, partly based on, on mapping and on, uh, visual, on, uh, on drawing. But of course, from the nature of our profession, the uh, emphasis is more on text than on, uh, on image. And also, uh, we've been engaged with uh, the transformation of some um, uh, urban artifacts, historical monuments, um, which also requires the wearing of these uh, uh, things, hard, hard hats. Um, so there is, there is a, a very practical side to uh, our work and um, uh, so we have um, made this decision from the, from the beginning on to sort of step outside into, into the real world and not in academia if you could call it, uh, if you could juxtapose it like that. Um, but this uh, really getting things done is uh, something which is very high on our uh, wish list. Um, we made a lot of exhibitions. Uh, this actually touches more upon the, uh, the theme of the, uh, the first session this morning on how to use visualization to tell a story. Uh, what role the, the form, the format and the visualization can have in, uh, in telling a story, in bringing the narrative. For instance, this was the uh, uh, exhibition we did for the 2012 uh, Venice uh, uh, Biennale uh, in which there is a well, this is actually an urban diagram, believe it or not. It's the Ebenezer Howard Garden City Scheme, which we sort of monumentalized in this way and uh, uh, connected to these uh, triptychs, which actually tell the stories of uh, six cities um, in, the, uh, in a way that emphasizes the sort of um, uh, 
the well, I wouldn't call it holy, but it's and it's not um, um, religious either, but it sort of um, um, makes it into a body of uh, historical work to to shape it like triptychs. And this uh, is actually when we were asked to um, uh, make a, an exhibition on the history of Rotterdam. We made these really large panoramas depicting different periods of this uh, history of Rotterdam. And these were actually uh, nine meters shaping a, a circular uh, panorama in which you could go into, be completely immersed in this, in this history, while also the text, which is like the normal way to express architectural history, would be this one sentence that was uh, on the bottom of this, uh, of this image. And then in the middle there was music of that period, so as to uh, immerse the audience. So you could say um, that this kind of visualization um, tries to find a format which is most suited to tell a narrative to different kinds of audiences. And, um, well, we've always enjoyed this a lot to do, uh, to do projects like that. The socio-political aspects uh, have become uh, most important for us from the, the uh, Wimby project on, which is the Welcome into My Backyard. Um, and as the name explains, it's, it's, you could say it's the product of this uh, period in the Netherlands when multiculturalism was still en vogue and normal, um, uh, as opposed to uh, the period uh, now. Um, and that's why we chose this title. Um, in this case, we work with uh, uh, inhabitants and uh, local stakeholders, local entrepreneurs, to make uh, things like this. Um, this is a party hall for Sur of two Surinamese brothers for the uh, ethnic groups of Antillians and Surinamese. Um, this is, we work with a graphic designer here to make an artwork depicting the, the loved memories of the senior citizens which lived in this uh, senior citizen's house. Uh, we work with um, uh, urban planners to come up with a, a way to visualize the urban future of this particular area that it was concerned. And we work, this is actually my favorite, we work with um, a cartoon uh, artist to uh, not depict what we'd done, but what we were afraid that would happen. We made this co-housing uh, project of uh, one of musicians and one of eco-lovers, and we were, we were afraid that it would be too idealistic, and that, in fact, these groups would clash, and that it would become like this dystopian... Uh, situation instead of the utopian uh, situation as we as we were hoping for, and uh, this was depicted by this uh, by this artist. So um, again, these are the you you need to find the way of expressing a narrative uh, the way that's most effective. Um, but I would say that the the, the phase that we are now in um, is much more geared towards. Um, the um, social political uh, aspects of uh, our work, in this um, case with uh, the International Newtown Institute. And we are working in uh, uh, a lot of different cities uh, around the world and different continents. And actually the, the aim of this uh, institute is to uh, research uh, the new areas where urbanization is taking a very fast pace and to come up with uh, solutions for the often very bad quality uh, urban plans that are me being made for those uh, for those areas. So the aim is to enhance the quality of life in those uh, areas. And to uh, give you an example, uh, we started two years ago in uh, Shenzhen in China, just uh, across the border from Hong Kong. The theme is uh, city in transformation because this is a city that actually wants to transform itself from a manufacturing city to a service industry. And uh, that has to do with a lot of migration, uh, migrants being housed in urban villages. I'm sure you're familiar with that phenomenon. And, um, uh, and a lot of problems occurring uh, from that, and a huge gap between the reality of the city and the planners, uh, the policies' uh, dreams. So what we actually did in this case was to house, uh, to invite an interdisciplinary team of landscape uh, architects, of ecologists, of sociologists, and to combine architects, not to forget, and to combine them with their Chinese counterparts and to uh, together pick up the most urgent questions that were uh, present in Shenzhen and come up with uh, uh, alternatives. And then also uh, connecting them to policymakers 
so as to have a real influence and to make the uh, implementation of these plans uh, feasible. So we also had to uh, sit in on these uh, diners, etc., and present the plans and in a way that also policymakers uh, are able to uh, understand them. Or another uh, same thing, Shenzhen. I knew that. Um, this is uh, what we did in uh, December. We had students, so it's also a student exchange, not only uh, professionals. Students studying migrant culture in uh, Shenzhen and coming up with uh, uh, a number of really surprising conclusions as to the liveliness of this, uh, of this migrant culture, uh, which completely escapes the uh, attention of both policymakers and professional uh, designers. And then we translated this, this uh, results of the students in an event uh, showcasing this uh, culture, skateboarding, music, etc. So, um, as to, and we did that at the um, uh, Shenzhen Biennale, so as to uh, connect these two groups of professionals and uh, local uh, migrants. Well, I'll skip through this. We're doing the same thing in, in different cities, but always uh, based on the local questions which are being formulated by local partners. And this is the big challenge, I think, how to cooperate uh, with uh, local colleagues uh, and how to, um, trans how to find a common ground and a common language. And I think that this is something that I heard um, uh, a lot of times today, how to find a common language with other disciplines. That is difficult enough. But how to find a common language with colleagues abroad in the different culture, with a different background, with all the... Um, difficulties of uh, neo-colonialism, and you can imagine what in a, a country like South Africa, what the what the, um, the the difficulties might be. That is the real uh, issue for me. So it's not really uh, transdisciplinary, but transcultural. I would say interdisciplinary working. We all do that, and uh, I think we all agree, and that is, has become clear today that uh, this has become a fact of life. And um, uh, that we uh, all agree on that we should do this. but So I would say we're post-disciplinary. But uh, how to work transcultural or uh, transnational, I think that is the big uh, uh, question. And I'll leave it at that. Even though there's a lot more to say. <laughs> I have to always lower the microscope. <laughs> okay, I think the point is right. I think it's okay. I'm going to use it. So I'm going to take you to a little bit different path. Um, I call this work as a story of a coconut fiber. And I'm going to talk about two aspects of it. They are totally different. One is engineering, another is social science. And I'll tell you the story how I got involved with my student in this project. Uh, the project which, which I listed here is really, uh, as engineers, and I'm a civil environmental engineer, we try to solve a problem in our, our own way. And sometimes we don't look at the other aspect of it. We think that we have a problem, we define it, we narrow down it, we come up with a solution, and we think it's a perfect solution. But that's not the case, and that's the learning experience I had working on this project. Now, why I started this project, this is an important issue. Uh, and I think it may not make it very important because we see all the time soil being washed. But in this country alone, we lose 4 billion tons of soil sediment every year. And majority of that losses are from agriculture. But a lot of loss happens, and many of these soil sediment go in our water body. And that be lake, that can be rivers, that can be pond, and it has a lot of negative effect on that. So as one of the engineering problems, as we are involved in construction and design, we have to look at that issue, how we can minimize 
and we call that soil erosion because that changes the temperature of the water body, it changes the quality of the water and many times we don't want to change because the cost of building a filtration plant is enormous. So there is a issue of the money also come into addressing some of the issues which engineers always have to keep in mind that issue. Now one of the ways how we can really simply minimize some of these kind of losses is using a material which we call erosion control material. And many of these materials have been developed in last 15 years and every day new material is coming up. And many of these construction materials are made of polymers and many of them which are used for a short period of time are made of natural fibers. And these natural fibers could be wood, that can be a straw, that can be a rice straw or wheat straw, it could be plant of the willows and in some cases we use what we call jute and coconut. And this is where the story of coconut fiber comes into that. So for my research with my graduate student, it happens to be a female student doing a PhD in civil engineering at the same time doing a master's in public policy. So she is taking courses in public policy and I'm learning with her what are these courses and how do they change the way we think about the problem. So one of the project as we do work in the lab and we go to the field is really not too far from here is a very clean lake. We have a skinny Atlas Lake. And skinny Atlas Lake where we get the waters, one of the best quality water, is a unfiltered water. And it needs to stay unfiltered means any brook, any stream which takes the water to this lake has to be clean water. So there is a big initiative that we were part of it. The farmers have all this water coming from the fields going to a stream and we wanted to install some of these erosion control product in these stream to look at their performance which we measure in the field. So one of the project is that we go to the field site, we install these products, we go month by month, except this winter, of course, you can go. But we measure the grass coat, we look at the sediments, we look at the water quality, and we compare the performance of different products which are installed in the field. And then we compare these performance, so this is one of the product made of coconut fiber, and fibers are not coming from this country. Most of these fibers are either coming from Sri Lanka, and in this case, it happened to be coming from India, where I grew up and I did my undergraduate degree. Uh, so that is a connection I'm making. I'm looking at the performance of the coconut fiber, jute fiber, wood fiber, and lots of other straws which are, and we measure these performance in the field. And then we bring these samples as scientists and engineers do, we simulate the field condition in the lab. So we have a rain a splash or a dripping method. We install the product in different soil conditions and we measure the performance. And based on these performance, we can come up with a design issue. So we have done a lot of work and uh, have fun with it, but it's been challenged. We grow vegetation in that. We plant different type of grasses and look at the performance so that we have an idea that when we recommend in for a new project site, what should these product be? So this is a very typical engineering approach. We take the problem and we are not trying to solve all environmental or all erosion problem, but looking at water quality. And if we install these products and our farmers and train the farmers, we can minimize some of the impact of that. Now, a question came because my student was taking public policy course, and it happened to be that NSF was requesting proposals to have international collaboration for female engineers and scientists. So we said this is the perfect time. I always wanted to study this aspect, so we wrote a grant. And it's called WISC. This is to, it was a few thousand dollars, and which took us to India with me and my graduate student, uh, to village which I start the story of coconut fiber, okay? So in India, uh, the, uh, the part which is called Kerala, and if we convert or translate this name Kerala, 
the name is, it is a, a land of coconut. It means land of coconut. It's a beautiful country full of coconut trees and beaches. And the history of coconut being part of that uh, group of people has been a few thousand years old. And coconut five or tree is every aspect of coconut tree is used in some way. And coconut fiber, which I'm talking about, is a husk of coconut shell, which has been taken out for thousands of years. And it happened that the, when the coconut fibers are taken out, they are soaked in the streams of the water, which we call backwater. They're beautiful waters. And, but in that process, sometimes water gets polluted. And these fibers are taken out. And typically, for hundreds of years, Women workers have been using these fiber to thatch and clean, and they come up with what we call golden fiber, okay? So there's a long history of women workers working from generation to generation in this particular industry. So our goal was to go to India, look at that industry, not as only the people working in their homes, but look at a small industry, large industry, and some of the organization, government organization, talk to them that what is happening to this coconut fiber industry. So this was the, uh, and definitely look at the life of the women. Uh, I come from India, but I don't speak this language. This was my first trip going to India and conducting interview with women workers and, and so NGOs and government officials and so I had to pick up the skills to what are the kind of question. How do you ask this question? What are we looking for? It's a totally new and actually very, very good experience. A beautiful country. We picked three different villages where we went. So as a scientist, we listed all the criteria. Where are the largest number of women? We had a translator with us, and we learned that not always positive things. Uh, but uh, fibers are like sitting right here. These are the stack of fibers, which are provided to uh, people, women who are working in this industry, by a third party. So these women buy these fibers, and then many of them are working few hours, eight hours, 10 hours a day, making ropes. And these ropes are made with a very little technology which has been used for 200 or 300 years. And whole generation, little girl to mother and grandmother, they are producing this right in their backyard. And once they make the ropes of different quality, then they take it to another dealer who buys these products and sell to the third party and fourth party and fifth party. Uh, and in our research, we conducted interviews for women workers, <coughs> manufacturers, and exporters, and all the agencies, and toured the factory. But most important things I think I can go about, the data and all of that, was my experience when I conducted first-time interviews with these women. And I will never forget that one of the women um, uh, asked me, what is the, why are you conducting this interview? And I mentioned that, but because we are looking for this information. And she said, what is for me? What are you going to do for me? And so those kind of questions I would have never thought had I not been gone. And we learn about what technology and globalization has done to the life of that. So I think this project not only taught me and my student, but it has really changed the way I now address and take some of the issues. And I brought this all the time in my classroom. So this is a story of a coconut fiber. Thank you.
So, uh, full screen. Oh, wow. I got it. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm actually just speaking about one project, not doing an um, sort of overview of my practice. This is the project that's the most um, relevant to this panel. Um, while my sort of broader work spans photography, video, performance, and installation. Photography, uh, for all my work, is central. Um, not just the process of making photographs, but the various conceptual frameworks that have informed the historical and contemporary practice of the medium. Uh, there are a couple of recurring themes that present themselves. One is an interest in um, narrative structure and the ways that narrative can be transmitted to the viewer. Um, another is performance which is, of course, um, inherent to the practice of photography, at least where um, it concerns uh, portraiture, which this project is primarily. Um, any subject that stands before the camera is arranging and editing not just their appearance, but their persona. Um, but I am concerned, not just through this project, but in general when I'm working with portraiture, um, with the performance taking place on both sides of the camera, how power can shift between the photographer and the subject, and whether the image resulting from this exchange is more a representation of one or the other. Um, the body of work that's most relevant um, to this panel is entitled Pas Bouger en Co, uh, which uses the studio portrait to explore embedded hierarchies between photographers, subjects, and viewers. The work is driven in part by the question of whether it's possible for a quote unquote first world artist, and I use that really for lack of a better term, um, whether it's possible for a first world artist to make photographs um, in the third world of um, individuals without voyeurism or objectification. Uh, so in an attempt to explore this possibility, I um, opened uh, an outdoor portrait studio in um, the Grand Rue neighborhood of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, um, which is a downtown um, semi-industrial business district, fairly low income. Um, advertisements circulated the news that a photography studio had opened in the neighborhood and um, anyone in the local community who wanted could make an appointment to have their portrait made. Uh, for free, and in, on the first, my first visit there, working from um, late November to mid-December 2009, I photographed 120 people over a period of 10 days. So the images were shot with an 8x10 camera. Um, it's a large format camera. Some of my students, of course, are familiar with that. The rest of you may not be. It's a, quite a production. It's like you put the cloth over your head. It's a big, um, it's kind of a big show for anyone that's around. And since this was uh, public, it was more or less just off the street. There was a constantly an audience, which was um, interesting for me in that I, I'm not normally used to working that way. Um, but the, those first images referenced the work of uh, early studio photographers like Mike Disfarmer and Seydou Kida, who were working um, at the same time, but half a world apart. Disfarmer um, in the United States in the 1940s in rural Arkansas and Kida um, who had a well-known studio in Mali that uh, started in like 1948. Um, and I was interested in that model because both of them were able to use the commercial and utilitarian aspects of their practice to uh, address the people they were photographing with this, a really sort of um, clear-eyed consideration. Uh, and that the work outgrew in both cases its um, commercial um, origins. In other words, both of them are marketed as, as fine art photography now, so they've jumped um, genres. Um, and the question of studio photography, I set myself up on that first trip as a studio photography, although um, that practice has its own sort of um, baggage associated with it. Uh, I was interested in it because the parameters of the exchange between the 
photographer and the subject in that particular in that particular format are um, really well defined, very clearly defined, and very widely understood. In other words, the setup that I was using, um, which was initially um, with a backdrop and people making appointments and coming and have their portrait made, there were. Um, studios throughout Port-au-Prince that operated exactly the same way, uh, but you could find a studio like that in almost any country in the world. Um, so the meaning of those images, of course, changed after the earthquake. Um, they became both uh, records and memorials. Um, but the earthquake also shifted the focus of the project um, quite dramatically. Um, in what probably formally one of the biggest ways it shifted the focus of the project is I stopped after um, a short period of time using the backdrop. Um, but I began focusing on, on uh, quite more specific populations, um, UN uh, employees, uh, NGO employees, government administrators. Um, I became interested in um, the country, the sort of socioeconomic political structure of the country. Um, so issues of representation, uh, visual sovereignty, and a cultural protocol, which were central to the project from the beginning, um, became more complicated after the earthquake. Um, so when I first arrived in Port-au-Prince, I imagined uh, that positioning myself in this very specific way as a studio photographer would allow me to escape this kind of complex um, tangle of hierarchies and politics that were at play in the work. Um, which turned out really not to be the case. Uh, it was sort of a pipe dream. Um, you know, I would say instead that layers of um, meaning and intention continue to reveal themselves as I um, continue to do the work, and they continue to engage the sort of um, contradictions and impossibilities that are present in the work's original question. Um, in terms of collaboration, it's sort of possible to say that I am collaborating with my subjects uh, in that they choose how to represent themselves. I do not direct them in any way. Um, some subjects refuse to dictate this, and in those cases I ask questions that will give me some idea. Um, the transdisciplinary aspect comes uh, up more in the ways that the work um, references and is forced to negotiate the range of photographic practices it traverses. And those practices include um, commercial studio portraiture, documentary, fine art, um, photo historical, and most um, problematic, um, probably uh, ethnographic practice. And so working within and across these um, often conflicting territories is a constant struggle. Um, and that is one that's probably best um, represented by this clip from a video piece I've also been working on, which is ho hopefully going to play. If I can, hello. Okay. So, um, this is an interview with uh, someone I photographed, facilitated by the translator, Jean Rodrigue Alcina. Oh, I need sound. Okay. Oh my gosh, I'm struggling that. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. It's because I think it's actually it's serious. Wow. Actually, this is one of the reasons why I'm asking the questions I'm asking. Because I believe that if you came here to spend some time here in Haiti and uh, spending your time into giving your help to the Haitian population, but it's because there's something that you're trying to succeed into. It's something you want accomplished, you want done up. Um, the, uh, the idea of the Biennale is an exchange. The idea, the exchange that I've got now. Which seems like it could be really difficult because we're like such different worlds. No, the point is that both of us are both very difficult because we're more New York different, more Haitian, with more Paris or Zeta Junior. And uh, so. Yeah, I just, um, yeah, I don't know how to say it. It's funny because I never am able to have this discussion with somebody that it actually concerns. So that is also sort of the crux of the project.
that? I may need help here. Wait, no. Oh, I may get it. Oh, maybe. It's just at the bottom. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Control L. Okay. Got it. Yes. All right. So, um, my presentation changed after my conversation with Shoba because we found that there were some really interesting and unexpected overlaps in our methodology. And so the way I want to present this, I'm going to look at one project, some research that I've been doing for many years, and I want to talk about it more from a methodological approach and how that approach changed over the course of the research because of impediments or roadblocks and having to figure out ways to do it. So I... Um, uh, this work is from the, the most recent book, Contested Spaces, and it's looking at the space of abortion clinics. And I originally started to look at a space like this because I was really frustrated with architecture not taking on politics. And so in the way that Elizabeth Gross asked, how can we make architecture think, I would also say, how can we make architecture be engaged within our political landscape? And so for me, taking on a subject like abortion clinics, which is inherently politicized, in all of North America, actually both north and south of our borders, uh, forced me to have to think about something that was inherently a politicized space. And I start with this image, which I think is actually quite important because it's an image of a, a, of a Planned Parenthood in Boston. And you'll notice the yellow line drawn on the ground, which is a 35-foot buffer zone. This zone has been legislated by the state courts as a space for protection for those trying to get into clinics. It's currently um, there's a current uh, argument in front of the Supreme Court, McCullen versus Coakley, which is debating whether these buffer zones are legal in the terms of free speech. So for me, this becomes incredibly interesting and was one of the entrance points into this research is looking at contestation within the role of our public realm. So the issue of our, our First Amendment, which guarantees us the right to protest, which guarantees us the right to peacefully assemble, and I'll, I'll say that in quotes when we talk about abortion protesters, and how that gets legislated literally with a line on the ground or other mechanisms that start to uh, define how and where we can move. So this issue of, of something being so political, how it gets legislated within our built environment is something where I want architecture to have to, to think about and go, which is a very uncomfortable place to be located. Um, so. I started this research initially looking at legal rulings, which far outside my, my knowledge base. I, I have talked to some lawyers. I have uh, tried to interpret legal um, Supreme Court rulings, like reading them, uh, looking at legal scholars who interpret them and, and critique them. And I realized that the issue of visualization is incredibly key in this research. And how can I take something that on paper reads as very banal there's 35-foot zone around the building, and start to make that visual so that we, the general public can understand it. So for me, being an architect um, in a discipline that isn't very politically engaged or historically hasn't been very politically engaged, I'm interested in reaching a far broader public. I actually, in some ways, don't care what architects think, although I want this to impact what architects think, but I want architectural thinking, design thinking, to make a difference out in the world. So if I can visualize some of these, these spaces, these constraints, um, these zoning issues, how can I garner a larger group to start working on these issues? So in this case, Colorado versus Hill, it was a Supreme Court decision decided in 2000. Um, but actually began in the 80s from the state of uh, Colorado. It mandated a 100-foot dimension around a clinic that was a fixed zone of protection, and then an 8-foot bubble where uh, someone going in and out of that zone would have protection. So you wouldn't be able to be harassed or handed a pamphlet unless you agreed to it. So it started to literally define our environment through very fixed uh, dimensions. So I went through a whole range of these uh, analysis as a way to understand what are the spatial implications that we're talking about. And it got me thinking about the issue, and this is primarily about the role of free speech and how much speech can be controlled within our public realm. So for when we talk about abortion rulings, inherently it's about free speech. So I started to look at, well, are there other spaces in the U.S. where free speech gets either um, 
eliminated or it gets reduced. And so if you've ever voted, you will know in every voting precinct in this country, there's a sign on the door before you enter. And it says that within 100 feet from this door, you cannot have any political speech, you cannot have any political signs, you can have no political speech within 100 feet. So clearly, the Supreme Court is allowing free speech to be uh, not just negotiated, but eliminated within a certain space within our built environment. So it got me thinking, well, are there other ones? And because of our 10 slide limit, I'm not gonna show you this, but the, the Supreme Court has a big line around that building that won't let protesters stand within, um, you have to be on the other side of the sidewalk. And then also most recently, Obama passed in 2012, uh, a ruling, a law that um, mandated a 300 distance of military funerals, both two hours before and two hours after funerals, in order to control, um, actually to shut down uh, uh, protest. So that begs the question that if in these certain cases, free speech can be eliminated, can be controlled, why can't that happen around clinics, even in a temporal way? So at first in this research, I thought in a very probably banal way, well, I'll just go to our local Planned Parenthood, I'll look regionally, I want to interview patients, I want to interview um, doctors, employees, to understand how are they negotiating that zone of protesters to get into the front door. Um, but I realized, so it took a year and a half, I was going through the bureaucratic chain of Planned Parenthood, and they said no. And so I thought, oh God, how, what am I gonna do now? This was my research project. I was tenure track, you know, this was, I was betting on this thing. And I realized that I didn't wanna give up on the project because I felt like there'd been no architects who looked at this. So this was an unchar uncharted territory. Um, and I felt like it was worthwhile. So it made me have to zoom out and think more about the issue at the nation level and at the state level. So I started looking at, uh, what are, where are the providers in this country? So it doesn't really matter that you can't read this, but what matters is the gray zones are, are counties with providers and the white zones are counties with no providers. So over 89% of the counties in this country have no access to reproductive um, health care, a reproductive health care uh, provider. Then I started looking at, well, what are these restrictions? And so I made an icon system, which goes back to the issue of if you visualize information that's somewhat boring or somewhat uh, difficult to access, more people will understand it. And I mapped that across all the states as a way to start to understand where there's concentrations of restrictions and what kind of restrictions are getting concentrated uh, regionally. Then I started looking at the most restrictive states. So it's not the issue of the ones that have more providers like California, New York, but it's the ones that don't. So looking at a state like Mississippi, uh, which has only one clinic left uh, in, the, in the state and they're drastic, the state legislature and the anti-choice choice movement are really trying to get that clinic closed. Um, I want to understand what are the larger spatial, social, economic, and political uh, pressures on a state that, that causes there to be less um, access. So looking at poverty rates. So this is just uh, re a poverty rate of an individual, which is the dark big circle, and then poverty rates of single female head of households with children under five, because statistically those are the people who are um, seeking uh, that kind of service uh, more readily. Also looking at hospitals, if they were a point of contact, Pharmacies, if we think about emergency contraception, so you don't even need to potentially get to a clinic. And then religious institutions. So there are over, um, I think there are over like 8,000 religious institutions in the state of Mississippi alone, and then I mapped that as well. In terms of pharmacies, myself and research, uh, research assistants called all the pharmacies in the most restrictive states, and we created this database. So what the gender of the pharmacist was who answered, what their answer was, and whether they stocked and sold this, and then some of their kind of crazy comments we would get as an aside or, or whether we even got hung up on. And we determined in Mississippi, for example, 66% of the male pharmacists won't stock it, won't stock it, and 55% of the female pharmacists will not stock it. So what should be an easy thing to get with a prescription or now without a prescription, you can't even get it because of a conscientious law that allows them not to do so. So where does this all lead? So I've been talking to, to lawyers, I've been talking to healthcare practitioners outside of architecture um, as a way to, to let this design expertise, this diagramming, this mapping, hopefully help them in their arguments in front of uh, legislatures and, and courts. And most recently, in terms of trying to get this work out 
to the public realm, um, I'm in process of designing a design competition for the, the only clinic in the state of Mississippi, and it was because I went there to interview her and the, own, and the uh, director that I realized, you'll see the, the fence, it's a wrought iron fence that actually has black plastic sheeting right now, duct tape to it, it's horrendous. And the protesters can stand right on that sidewalk, so there's no, there's no security, there's no real visual barrier between the protesters and the uh, people working there and the patients. So we're going to be designing a two-phase competition to do an installation in that fence as a way to put this research into practice in a, in a, in a kind of actual way in the built environment. So I, I find this project, and it was not intended, I never thought this would be an, an output of this research, but it was because of the methods and the research and what I found along the way that enabled this to even be an idea that would be possible. Um, so it's, it's a way that research starts to take its own trajectory and you, you find and discover things along the way uh, that you would never have imagined. So that's my 10 minutes. Thank you very much for that. I have two questions, and then I'd like to open up to the packed audience. This is great. Um, the first one is about translation. This seems to be the most um, uh, very global uh, panel. You guys talked about Europe, China, India, Haiti, Turkey, you, Europe in Turkey as well, Lori, uh, US and Africa. Um, and all of your work involves some kind of translation, either from uh, traditional material into engineered um, and highly specialized material to cultural uh, to visual uh, information, uh, data into information. So can you, and another thing that I was thinking about throughout the day was that geography is something that we do, not just something that we are in. It's action-based, something that we, uh, we in internalize as well as uh, we um, externalize. So can you talk about the relationship between um, what you guys practice as well as where you practice in, as well as um, what you do in it, which is uh, some kind of translation of your concepts into projects? Of course, this, uh, this notion of uh, working abroad in different cultures or continents, it brings up the, up the question of uh, something that you also um, uh, talked about, how the relation is with the, uh, the, well, the persons that you work with, the subject before or behind the camera, or in, uh, or in my case, the professionals that you uh, need to work with, brings up this question of uh, common language. But, um, so it needs to be problematized, but on the other hand, I was... Uh, Something that was uh, striking, I thought, in your uh, uh, story, is that you are from India. Um, and uh, nonetheless, when you uh, started to do your research there, uh, you were surprised by this first question, uh, which was, I thought, very predictable in a way. Huh? Uh, so it, it's not only a question of uh, how to become acquainted with a culture, but it also has your professional background, how to uh, relate from that point of view to the persons that you work with. That is, so uh, I don't think that we're, we are supposed to feel handicapped by our uh, Western background. And um, also, well, yeah, let's, let's keep on. I think uh, you raised a very good point. I think I was, uh, although, I mean, for people from outside, before when I went to do interviews, it was obvious question. 
Uh, but as an engineer, my products never talk back to me. <laughs> so uh, for me, as somebody looking in my eyes and asking me, are you using me for your research? And am I doing really? That made me think much deeper than I would have thought. Because the, it was, her point was that many people come, as they do, uh, NGOs and many organizations and social scientists, they come and ask them all these questions, get the story of their life, collect the data, and leave. And what is done in return for them? And I think that was the point. I never thought, and I felt it, and I think I feel very deeply, and I still remember that. So now I think I'm very sensitive uh, to that, but I think also this project left very, um, not a wonderful feeling for me because it was such a large project to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that. I uh, contacted NGO, I went to World Bank, uh, asked to do what can be done. But this is not one of my research area, main research area. So you make choices how much time you're going to spend. And also I learned this project, in, in any small way to make a difference, you need a large collaborative team. One or two people cannot make a difference, and I, in an in end, I ended up writing a book. So I'm hoping that more people are using for teaching to at least think about it. I've not given up on the project. I'm still look, looking for collaborators, and I continue to go to India and give lectures and talk to people. So but it make you think that problem is so big and multifaceted, the difference you can make, which is important, but it's a small difference. Um, part of the translation for me was obviously language, um, and the video I've been working on, you know, positions the translator that you don't see either of the parties in the conversation as the locus for all of the difficulties, uh, really impossibilities, I used that term before, but it's incredibly difficult to resolve. and. Um, the other form of tr translation is the sort of fine art uh, to uh, sort of everyday uh, non-art audience. And I'm photographing non-artists and a lot of um, the people I was photographing had questions about what I was doing. Um, and also um, the desire to make your project into something, you know, that question of what is it going to do for me. People didn't ask me that directly, and, and I had made um, the parameters of that exchange very explicit. In other words, people would pose for me and they would get a print, and that was, that was it. Um, there is a desire, um, less by the people I was photographing, more than outside of outside parties, to uh, apply this kind of, um, uh, like an NGO, to graft a kind of NGO, or a, sort of the aid structure on top of that work. And, um, that seems sort of like a it's a it's a very dominant uh, paradigm there. That's a very dominant relationship structure between anyone Western and anyone any foreigner and, and the inhabitants of that particular country. And um, resisting the desire to frame the work that way um, was difficult and constant and it's constant. Yeah. I think in, in my case it's so uh, inherently about a local, we'll say state. Condition. I mean, with the, the project I presented. And uh, initially, I was doing interviews, so similar to Shoba, I'd never done interviews, hadn't really considered it, but realized that they're, the way they understand and, and work to do their job, so how do they make these clinics still operate within just sometimes egregious uh, conditions, was something I needed to understand because it affects the way you think about and potentially what you would do spatially. So when I began to interview them, and at first uh, Planned Parenthood was, was again out of the question that there was no way I was going to get access to any of the Planned Parenthoods for, for obvious reasons, I just cold called through letters, independent providers across the country and gradually was able to, to get access that way. And I felt like um, they were being so generous with their time, allowing me entree into this very, very difficult world that they occupy. And so that the book, the interviews became part of a, book, a chapter of the book, and I felt like 
it was a way to give them representation and voice because I think in the media very often their voice and their position are not so um, represented that we only hear the kind of onslaught of negativity and not what they're doing in these very di sometimes dire situations. So I felt like the way I could provide uh, representation for them was through creating a mechanism to, to give them a voice outside of a, uh, their usual context. So that was part of, for me, a translation issue for sure. And most of you touched on already um, about uh, the next question that I want to ask. Um, uh, this is the last chance that we get to talk about this, so we have to, about gender, mm -hmm. which we haven't done <laughs> so far, <laughs> strangely. So we have to talk about that. Um, and that is inherently about power. Um, so what feminists have been critiqued on is that you know, feminists just want to reverse the power dynamics and just want to take over what men have, which is probably not true. Some, some might agree. Some feminists might agree, but um, I have a feeling that this panel wouldn't. So it's the, the target or the issue is the governance, who is governing who in what way, and who gets to decide who, who does that. Um, can you speak about within your work, how do you negotiate the power you have? How do you negotiate the power that you are facing and the technique or methods of negotiation? For me, at least with this work, I mean, I have another body of work where I have looked at uh, more specifically gender relationship as it exists in relationships between artists and their partners. Um, but with this practice, I would say, in terms of my power, um, I think that my power in that situation, you know, my gender is eclipsed by my race and the country I come from. Um, so the fact that I am a white American is much, is the dominant. Um, I am very conscious in that all of the people that I work with are men. I, I, there's a, assist, you know, there's like a, an assistant that I work with in Haiti all the time. In fact, that um, guy that I was having a conversation with in 2009 eventually started working with me, and we work together every time I go. Is a man. The translator is a man. The driver is a man. Um, there's there's two fixers, Haitian, and actually they're not fixers anymore. A fixer is someone who might drive for you or translate or do some of that work. Uh, there's not a lot of women doing those jobs there. Um, so. It's something I'm conscious of. It's not, I'm, I'm you know, but it's, it's not a source of, well, I shouldn't say. I mean, it, it, it's a source of my power in that it's a quieter kind of power in that it's a more of a, um, the way that you use your feminine powers to like, like, like charm or like whatever. That's more of like the context that that exists in for me there. Yeah. I mean, I think mine's, Explicitly, <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't get around it. So, I think, I mean, I picked the subject of abortion not necessarily because it was a feminized female space, but because it was such a politicized space, which happens also to correspond to a woman's body. So it's a double whammy, um, which I don't, uh, which I think then makes it even more important to look at because. Uh, you know, statistically, women make less money. Statistically, we have less representation in government across the world. Statistically, we're, we just have less power in all decision-making kind of across the board. So how could you start to look at a space that is inherently about a woman's body and the politics around that that are inherently uh, a male, uh, male, the, the male, the demographic of, of Congress in these states are inherently male. Um, so men are, are legislating control over women's bodies. So for me, it's explicitly a feminist project. It's explicitly about how can I try to reveal some of these invisible things that are very much a part of this power structure that affects our built landscape. Um, whether they're primary, secondary, or tertiary, it's, it's always a part of that conversation. And I think you know the, the clinic in Mississippi, when I first went there a few years ago, it was beige. And I come back last year, and it was bright pink. And I was like, what the hell did you do? And she's like, I'm having so much trouble that I don't want them to miss it. I want it to be front and center. <laughs> I want them to see it like a mile down the road. 
And I thought, well, you know, I think it's, an, it's not a great color, but I understand the rationale <laughs> for doing it and why she did it. And it photographs really well. And it, she's been on, I mean, they are constantly on the, on the, on the news cycle everywhere. So um, I think, you know, how can I participate in that? Uh, and, you know, I'm invested in those issues anyway. So it, it, it's, I don't want to deep, I don't, I can't, um, I can't, unpack that because I think it's so inherently a part of the project that makes it more powerful to begin with. Well, for me, the, the topic of gender has never theoretically been an issue or part of my work. Um, but uh, having said that, it is a practical part. And especially now working abroad, I also realize that it has never been a topic because I come from a, a quite a privileged uh, country in which it's not really necessary to make this into uh, a topic. But now working in these other countries, I find that I have to um, uh, organize my work in a different way to cope with uh, uh, different ideas about, <laughs> about the, uh, uh, the sexes. So um, in, in China, I had this female project leader, but, and the only way that she uh, does her work really well is because she, she worked like 200%. So, so she has to put in a lot of extra effort that I don't think anybody else could do. In um, uh, Nairobi, I, I decided to have two project leaders, which are also, my organization consists of 90% uh, women, so I have to make do with them. And so I have sent two, so at least that they're a bit stronger. And for Cape Town, I've uh, hired a, a guy. Just because uh, it is so much more difficult to get respect and to be uh, acknowledged as a, uh, an equal uh, partner in those countries. So it is uh, a fact of life that makes you realize something. Even if you're white in Cape Town? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, being white in China is... Uh, it's not an advantage at all. <laughs> no, it's a, yeah. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, some of the questions you're asking, you know, you um, I never think about it. Uh, for me, in, in terms of this project, which I talked about, this is one of my research projects, the women I was looking at, and there are and women working in the uh, coconut fiber industry, predominantly be always for hundreds of years women. And I know their lives have been getting worse and worse because of globalization, because of technology. So for me, that was an important part of that. Um, I have, I'm a civil engineer, and I always have been a minority in my classroom and in my PhD program, and, and uh, I was the only one female faculty when I joined Syracuse Uni University for 15 years. So for me, that creating a women in science and engineering was a way uh, to connect to other women and uh, creating a better place for other women who would be following me. So today you had Julie and uh, Becky. It's wonderful to have more women. So for me, that isolation which I felt at many different level uh, is to really not to have the same for others. So not that I don't believe the men should have similar organization. It should be called my actually men in the science and engineering. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it has really done very well for all because many programs created for them has helped everybody. So that's for me to really do something about it and being also being helped. It's not that. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for all of your presentations. Um, this question is specifically for Professor Roy Brown. Um, so during your presentation, you alluded to the fact that maybe architects aren't your main audience, mm -hmm. and that, um, so I wanted to ask you, like, who do you identify as your main audience? Is it the parts of government, do, do you want to highlight these issues, parts of government, so sort of a top-down approach? Are they the users of the clinic, so maybe a bottom-up approach, or is it sort of the organizations which is kind of hitting a middle midpoint? And if it's any of those, I question 
the legibility of the research that has been produced in the form of a book, because that, in the form of a book, because that still requires some sort of um, college, I guess, college level education in order to be fully, fully acquainted with this diagram format or with some of the vocabulary that you may use. So um, I just wanted you to respond to how you think your research is really impactful in the audience that you uh, tried to reach. Well, I don't think it is yet, and I'm, I'm reaching, I think it's getting there. But I think I had, I was working within my own disciplinary structure in the beginning and realizing that I was, I was needing other disciplinary knowledge. So looking at geography, looking at um, political philosophy for the understanding of the politics around public space. Um, and then bringing it back through my own disciplinary lens to make these drawings, make these diagrams, make these maps, which then I've begun to take to other conferences. So um, I'm intersecting with the legal, the, with law, I'm intersecting with um, women's health care providers, I'm intersecting with more grassroots organizations. So I think I, I can only get, I, I'm only able to get to that point because I did the more academic and say scholarly work. Um, so, and I knew as soon as I said, I'm not, in, I'm not as interested in architecture that somehow that was going to come back to haunt me. And so thank you. Um, but I, I, and I need it in a way that I think architecture needs to be more engaged in our everyday life for everyday people. And so I, so in that sense, I'm more interested in how can I disperse and engage with those outside of our discipline in order to do that, because otherwise architecture is not going to matter for those for the general public. And I think for me, that's the audience we need to be seeking. So I ha I felt like I, I could only get to where I am now because I've done all the other things that maybe these the general public wouldn't read or, or wouldn't be able to afford to buy the book because it's too damn expensive. Um, but I think there's a, a part of research that allows you then to start to engage far broader audiences because now I have a, a far greater working knowledge of all these issues um, and then hopefully bring it back through the competition into our discipline and, and I'll say the arts to, to do something out in the, to build something out in the environment. So I think it's, it's far more layered and nuanced than I really presented, but I think it, it's only because of the cycle that I've been able to, to begin to do that. So a follow-up on that is, have you been at any conferences in which you present your work to like a group that wasn't, you know, um, maybe students of another uh, discipline? Um, not students, but I've presented it to lawyers, I've presented it to other people in reproductive health care rights and providers, um, to uh, to some artists' organizations, so it's it's starting to get there, but not students in the sense of like this kind of um, purview yet. Because part of it is wanting to take action and I need to connect with those who can help, I can help and they can, we can collaborate to do that. And I mean, no offense, but it's, it's you know, people out in the world, policymakers, which would be another point of contact I haven't made yet, would be a way, a mechanism to do that. Do you want to address as well your, about your audience? I was, uh, I was intrigued by this uh, uh, aspect. You were also saying that um, uh, architects, architecture is not uh, traditionally uh, a, a politically engaged uh, discipline. Eh? But of course, there have been uh, sure. periods when it was. Sure. And um, I was under the impression that also in the US, uh, there is a, a new period now, you sure. should say, of the focus on everyday urbanism, uh, so to speak, on uh, uh, temporary interventions on bottom-up architecture, on social practice, etc. So I'm, I, I would, well, for sure, interpret your project as a sort of call to order mm -hmm. uh, to architects, to this audience. Yeah. No, that's true, absolutely. Yeah. So the student engagement is critical in that sense, and to try and educate, raise awareness. So hopefully there will be a, the younger generation who's interested, and I think they are, but I, I th when I started this research, there were less of those things going on, and it started um, definitely, like with the most recent Venice Bien Biennial, like the whole focus on installations and political engagement, so I think it's great, but, I, but this is the small scale, and I want it to impact larger scales of, of architecture and development. One of the questions about that is whether that's actual um, uh, 
a, a, a actual shift, or if it's oh. a, just a shift of dialogue or, or, a, or a trend. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, in terms of social practice, and this is something that um, Michelle and I have talked about, um, in that in both areas, um, this desire to apply a kind of uh, holistic dialogue to um, something practical or problematic um, has become um, very strong, yeah. and in a lot of cases, uh, really insincere. Just as a, it's like a new coat of paint. I was just wondering how, um, this question is kind of uh, directed to um, Professor Laura Brown and also um, um, Michelle Provost. Um, uh, uh, connecting the two of your presentations, um, in the beginning uh, Michelle had talked about um, the, not only how we became uh, post disciplinary but um, also taking into account culture and how we're um, taking a more transcultural approach. Um, and then with Professor Lori Brown's discussion on um, abortion clinics. And I was just wondering how do you mediate um, cultural clashes? Because um, like contested spaces, it is a, a very, um, uh, when you introdu introduce uh, politics into architecture, I mean, we talked about materiality and visualization earlier, and those you can't really, like, there's no, like, you can't really argue with those things, but when you introduce politics to things and it's also introducing it to uh, a general public, it becomes, um, you know, uh, contested. So, um, I was, and coming from, I'm from the South, so uh, uh, in my hometown over the summer, they were trying to open an abortion clinic and it was really difficult to do so. They, uh, I had a lot of friends that were um, involved in like a grassroots effort to uh, promote it, and um, so I'm just wondering how like architecture and politics actually can readily um, mediate, uh, you know, differing cultures and if there these if representations really comes uh, into the fore uh, to uh, change culture or if that's a if that's a thing or to I don't know really communicate um, your goals, I'm not sure. Um, well, I think it was interesting in some of the work that Michelle presented because there was built results of some of these uh, exchanges, which I thought was fantastic and was making me think, okay, so if I project what I'm doing down the road, can you know, will I be able to show and have that kind of success um, if, if that's in fact a goal? You know, I don't, I don't know if architecture can do that. Like, I don't know. I want it to. And I think the competition is a way to test it. I think the competition allows this, promotes the issue of politics and how can design intersect with it. Can we make spaces safer? Absolutely. Should we? Yes, in this context. Can we make the built environment better? Yes, like the black, the black plastic sheeting is atrocious. They sit in the middle of an arts district which is kind of the ironic thing because they've been, it's become gentrified since they bought the clinic over the last eight, uh, 20 years. So, you know, as a wanting the built environment to be better, to be a better place where people walk by and see it, to help sound dampering because there's such loud protests that the business across, across the street can't actually think some, sometimes during the day because it's so loud. Architecture can work to mitigate and hopefully <coughs> limit or minimize those issues, but can it ultimately um, do what I want it to do? I, I don't really know, but I want to try to, to, to put it in that direction. And I think even to get people to think about it and to create design possibility is a step in the right direction. So I'm using the competition as a way to, to make that conversation a, a broader one. And the first step is to engage people way outside our discipline. So it's a, the format's going to be for everyone, non-designers and designers. The second phase will be more design proposals. So I think you know, all, I, all I can do is push and hope that I'm um, raising awareness 
for, for, for you, for student, for, for others um, out in the world to think about what role the built environment plays in our everyday lives and how can we make that better. Whether that's, I mean, clearly they should be able to protest, absolutely, I believe in the First Amendment, but I also believe that someone should be able to safely walk down the street and get into a building because they want to and they have the legal right to do so. So it, it sets up uh, you know, that conflict, and that conflict's not going to go away. It's just not. So it has to be able to, to mediate between these two extremes in some sense. Sure. Uh, well, to be honest, we've never took on such, an, uh, such a difficult uh, assignment as an abortion clinic in the US. Um, <laughs> So uh, our, our projects were relatively harmless, <laughs> and and the, even then it's um, uh, difficult enough to um, uh, to connect the um, uh, the people that you want to build for to uh, the uh, to the power that you need to connect them to. But in this case, uh, I would say, I, mean, I, have to, I have to write everything down. <laughs> um, I would I would say that the the matter of awareness is indeed the most uh, important thing because uh, especially I think in an architecture school because you have to realize that this connection between design and politics is always there if you recognize it or not because uh, this is a, a, a quite an extreme case of uh, contested space but every kind of uh, decision to uh, to build a building anywhere uh, makes a, a, a different decision impossible so there's always only every choice everything always has to do with some kind of uh, politics and I think this uh, uh, awareness is a, a really important thing and a really important uh, uh, ingredient of uh, any design and uh, design uh, education. And then, of course, it is true that uh, not every uh, problem can be solved with a hardware solution. Uh, and in this case, it could, uh, it's rather uh, software or hardware, if you know that, that uh, definition. But, uh, so it, it might be more politics than, uh, than design still. The, uh, the, the matter of uh, uh, awareness can be dealt with through, uh, through the design. And I think, um, uh, especially here, you have some um, uh, very powerful offices, like uh, the um, uh, CUP office in uh, New York. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. So they use this uh, analytical tools and research as a, a tool to um, uh, analyze society and uh, also to give tools to the uh, underprivileged. Um, so, I'm Can wondering I if, um, what? <laughs> Go ahead. Can I just yeah, sure. point about what, what Laura um, presented, because I think that you, there is a statement about the power of architecture and design, and it may not be an intervention that you did mm -hmm. directly, but I think, especially in terms of presenting to us, when you said that when you came back, that building was bright pink, that, that building really stood out to me when you showed us that mm -hmm. picture. And, and when you told us how they had done that, um, that's a design intervention. Right. And what sure. their reason, and that's a really powerful one. And, and I think that um, calling attention to that is an important thing because they, they didn't hide, they didn't go into right. camouflage, they did the opposite because they're making a stand that we want you to find us no matter what. And that's a really brave thing, and that is because that structure was there, and it's bright pink, and it stands out. And I, I think in terms of the question that's being happening, I think that that's an important thing about what you're showing us. Mm -hmm. so. Wait, but Shoba, um, you're dealing with, you made something aware, people, you made something so that people would be aware that coconut shells can be used for really useful things. But you are facing the difficulties, now what? Now that we are aware, what are we going to do with it? So do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, so I, I can give a short answer and long answer as we can do that. So uh, for me as an engineer and as a faculty and uh, advisor to many <coughs> students, uh, Coconut is one fiber. So we are exploring many other fibers from the performance point of view. Okay, so that's not related to where it's come from, right? But now the when I do the other testing, I always talk about where do they come from. So it is a way of thinking of not just materials, because we use materials, we use polymers, we use concrete, we use soil. And I teach course in soil, so when we we have plenty of queries here. Now I always talk about, we keep on getting the material 
have you ever thought one day we will not be able to get? So the question of materials and thinking where they are coming from and what is the impact of that. So that has changed in my teaching and research. Questions for everyone, and uh, it's kind of similar to one expressed earlier about audience. But uh, there was a lot of talk about narrative and the expression of uh, or the representation of your projects. Um, and I'm curious to know how uh, the desire to express your projects in certain ways changed after immersing yourself in these cultures and even just getting to know or coming face to face with the people that your projects are impacting. For me, I would say um, it changes according to who I'm speaking to. Um, it also changes according to um, what I want from the person I'm speaking to. So I may describe that project slightly differently to, uh, say, a, a sort of upper level lobbyist, Haitian lobbyist who's going to the United States. Um, I would describe why I want to photograph him to him differently than I might describe it in this context. Like here, I would say, okay, I'm interested in um, the way that the West negotiates with the um, quote unquote developing world, again, for lack of a better term. Um, uh, actually, there's a, a Sri Lankan photographer who coined this term majority world that I mm. think is actually much more, it makes much more sense. Um, because we're not the majority anymore, although we continue to behave uh, as such. Um, so that I would describe it like that, but that is not how I describe it to him. You know, I describe it in the um, simplest, most clinical, least political terms that I can come up with. I think I, like thinking about, I went to this conference back in October and it was a law conference and I, I had to shift these the images that I selected in order for them to understand, or what I thought they would understand better in terms of spatial issues and spatial boundaries. Um, so looking at zoning codes and making diagrams of zoning codes that impact you know, these dimensions. And so I definitely thought about, I think the issue of who your audience is is critical and what you want them, what the takeaway to be, or hopefully the potential overlap and future collaboration maybe. So I, I tried to imagine what do I want them to take from this and what do I want them to see so that then I can work with them on future projects dealing with these issues. So I think it's about how you curate and what that curation is like and do you have to make new things in order to, to get to other audiences. Because I know some of these images are not, like we understand them because that's our language, but outside of here they have a very difficult time. So. Um, that's something I always have to think about, and I, I totally agree. It depends on what what you want to what you want them to get, and no, and trying to predict what your what your audience uh, will be able to visually understand, because we have a, a knowledge, a visual. Kind of language, a, language. A, a, I mean, even, even just like we're all speaking it, English, but the right. language of academia, or right? Absolutely, it's a, it's a class thing too. So yeah. It's a, you have asked a very, um, very excellent question. I think that made me think about it. And um, I did this work several years ago, and I'm thinking about, again, audience, and I'm looking at the academic audience. And what has changed that the work which I presented is not very typical of a, a work which I would present in a conference where I need to be recognized for my expertise. And so I don't present this result. But where do I present this conversation about women in science engineering or the social science? And it has been changed, actually. Maybe more comfortable I am and older I am getting, that's also an issue. More secure you become, it's easier to talk about not being thinking about consequences. And so then now I bring that research even in my conferences. And I'm not afraid of that. In fact, I enjoy that part. <laughs> and so that changed, okay? And, but it changed gradually. Well, I actually agree. 
that it, this is a difficult question. And I also feel that I'm right in the middle of this changing, changing narratives, really. Because uh, at first I was going to say, like, um, if you're uh, abroad in any country and you speak with people who have, like, the same profession or are, are also from the professional world, it tends to be rather easy to find common ground. But that is also because the people that you find, they speak English, so it's a hard thing. They have often been trained uh, in the UK or in the US. And um, if and there's a and there are of course a very, very small minority. To the people who are outside of that group, I uh, tend to and they tend to be like if you talk to uh, professionals in China or in Cape or wherever. They tend to be far more technocratic than um, what we are used to. So, uh, and this is also something that was uh, an original question for this uh, conference. Like, uh, we work interdisciplinary, but what boundaries are there to still to cross? Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I have uh, concluded for myself that there is the, the world of real estate and finance <laughs> that I have really <laughs> go, got to get into uh, because if. Uh, in most countries, you are not getting away with um, um, like uh, atmospheric stories about what a good city is. Uh, in most countries, they want to know uh, how many people per square meter, how, how wide should the streets be, how um, uh, urban management, what does it cost per person, etc. Et things that I don't really know, So, and it's outside of my comfort zone. And I think this also has a little bit to do with gender. Uh, it makes you extra vulnerable uh, if, as a woman, you don't know these factual, uh, the hard facts. So, um, I will have to uh, take a course. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that raises a really interesting point. When we were talking uh, before this, we both came to certain moments in our research that we just didn't know. And that, I think that's an important thing to recognize and actually not shy away from, is that we don't know everything, and that you don't have to pretend to know everything, and that that's part of the research process or the creative process. And I think so often we, we don't want to admit that publicly, like that means you're weak, you're vulnerable, but in fact, it also means we're human, and we share that with everyone, and that's a point of potential contact, because there's no way, I mean, you're, you're always going to need to know other things in order to to advance what you're doing. So I think it was an interesting, it was only through our discussion before this that we realized, wow, there are certain moments in our research that we just didn't know the answer, or we didn't, weren't sure how we were gonna proceed, and then you have to recalibrate. So it became a moment for me when I came to that point that I had to shift gears, and that actually proved quite fruitful after I got over the initial kind of shock of, oh shit, what am I gonna do, kind of thing, but that was good. Depends on what situation you are. Sure. Because of course, if you are a student or doing research, you can do that. If you are going to the minister or to mm -hmm. a big sponsor, you cannot do that. Yeah. Or you want to get, get uh, money. Get the uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fine. Okay.